Good morning. Impossible. What is impossible for you? I am sure at one time or another we might have thought that in our mind if we have not spoken it out loud. Impossible. Impossible to. So, what is impossible for you? Could it be that you are facing a health challenge that you are thinking there seems to be no way out of this problem? Or could it be that there's a financial challenge that you are faced with and you say, looks like this is impossible already? Could it be ministry related? Or for some of us, it may be someone whom we are hoping would come to know the Lord, but we feel it's just too stubborn. Wala nang pag asayan. He's hopeless. It's impossible that he will come to faith. So, the question is. What does the word impossible mean for you? Today we'll look at this passage, look at the concept of impossible. In our passage, the angel Gabriel had just given news to two ladies on two pieces of news that really sounded impossible, incredible. The first was, of course, the most famous woman, not just in the Christmas story, but the most famous woman in the entire Bible. Mary, of course. And the second is a not very well-known woman, someone whom we seldom associate with Christmas, Mary's relative, Elizabeth. Before we continue on, may I ask that we all pray once again, pray for ourselves, pray for the people around us, pray for me as I deliver God's word. Pray that the Holy Spirit will work in our midst. Indeed, Lord, please work in our hearts. Be our teacher this day. Amen. We have a daughter who's currently 17 years old. At the age of 13, you know, you can just imagine any 13-year-old. Essentially, in our culture, a 13-year-old is a child. Probably just playing, not being serious about life. And certainly, we cannot imagine marrying them off. You know, allowing them to get married at that age. But during New Testament times, it is said, it is not uncommon for young people 12 to 14 to be getting ready for marriage. And such was Mary. The Bible does not tell us how old Mary was when the angel appeared to her, but at that time she may have been 12 to 14 years old and she was engaged to be married to Joseph. We know the story. She was busy with her own thing at that time when the angel suddenly appears to her with this incredible news, unbelievable, life-changing. 
she was told that though she was still a virgin, she would be pregnant and would give birth to a son. And not just any son. The Son of God, the Messiah Himself. Let's take a moment to process this potentially scandalous situation. Mary was unmarried, a virgin, yet pregnant. In today's society, such is not uncommon. In today's society, we hear and perhaps we may even know of young girls getting pregnant before they're married. But such was not the case during that time. For the Jews, it was a sin that carried the penalty of being stoned to death. And yes, sooner or later, Joseph will find out. This was something that could not be hidden. It may, Mary may be able to successfully hide it for the first few months, but sooner or later it will be discovered. And Joseph, of course, would know, this is not my child. How would he trust her again? What shame. Well, today we're here to think about Mary, her response to the news. Incredible as the news may be, and I'm sure Mary must have been shaking with fear, Mary believed. Though young chronologically, her faith was somehow quite mature. The angel further gave her another incredible news to strengthen and support her faith some more. Here's what the angel says. Let's read together. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. Yes, Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. Mary's relative, Elizabeth, the Bible says she was already old. How old, we don't know. The Bible just describes her as old. And what's more, notice that phrase, with her who was called barren. The question is this, who called her barren? He says, her who was called barren. Who called her that? In all probability, it was probably society in general that had given her that label because she was childless and therefore she was given that label of barren. In at that time, being childless was a matter of shame. It was a shameful thing. And what's more, during that time, more often than not, it's the woman that was called barren, the woman who was said to be the problem. Hindi siya magkaanak. She can't bear child. And therefore, during that time, the religious leaders, because having a son to carry on the name is so important for them, sometimes the religious leaders would actually advise the husband to just divorce the wife who is barren and marry another woman in order to have someone to carry on the name. Elizabeth lived in such a culture 
But now, the passage says, she who was called barren was already six months pregnant. Again, think through her situation. She was old. How old? Well, old enough to be called old. Who knows? 50s, maybe. But imagine, she who was old, she who was barren all her life up to that point in time, was now pregnant six months. Unbelievable. Today, with the help of technology, these things like that are not unheard of. In fact, with in vitro fertilization, this is actually a real news headline. 60-year-old woman gave birth to twin boys. Can you imagine that? But in Mary's time, only God could have done it. But let's be clear. Even with technology today able to do that, God's power will always, always surpass any technology. Past, present, and future. There is no technology that can compare with God. Science is not God. There is only one God. And here's what the Bible reminds us of. Here's what the Bible reminds Mary of. And let us read this verse together. Luke 137, everyone. For nothing will be impossible with God. One more time. For nothing will be impossible with God. Why don't we memorize that? Luke 137. For nothing will be impossible with God. That is a fact that Mary needed to be reminded of. That is a fact that we can use again and again and again. God was telling Mary, Mary, yes, what I'm telling you may seem impossible, but let me tell you, it is not impossible with God. In fact, I've done the same thing for your cousin or for your relative, Elizabeth. If I could do it for her, I can do it for you. You have to believe it. Well, young as she was, Mary actually believed. How do we know she believed? She showed it. She showed it by what she said. She showed it by what she did. Her response of faith, her action of faith. You see, true faith shows in action. Her response of faith, Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. In submission, Mary says, Yes, let it be. Mary believed what was told her, that she was going to have a baby, that her older cousin barren cousin is going to have a baby and is six months pregnant. But she must have been really stressed out about it. You see, when we are faced with a challenge, with anxious thoughts, with stressful situations, we often want someone to talk to about what were facing. But Mary did not have anyone. Who would she talk to about that? Would she actually talk to Joseph about this news that she was given? Would Joseph believe what she was saying? Won't Joseph become angry with her? 
In all probability, at that time, the angel had not yet informed Joseph about the situation. And can Mary talk to her parents? Would they believe? Would they understand? Well, Mary believed, and by faith, she went to the only person who hopefully would understand. She hoped she was hoping that this lady she was going to visit would understand because they were, in a sense, in the same situation. And so, in those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. I imagine, since the angel appeared to Mary, Mary must have been really excited, you know, unable to really sit still, heart pounding, the message just ringing in her ears. You will have a baby, the Messiah, and your relative, also six months pregnant. All those questions with no one to discuss them with. When we have news like that, we would often nowadays just take out our cell phone, compose a quick text, send it off to whatever group we want to share it with. Mary had no such group message. So, she did what was available to her. She traveled. She walked. She went on foot to her relative. A relative who lived possibly 120 to 160 kilometers away. From Metro Manila, going north, 120 kilometers would probably take us to Pangasinan. To the south, 120 kilometers would take us somewhere to Batangas. So can you imagine walking that distance? At that time, it would probably take her somewhere between 5 to 10 days of walking. Well, Mary did not waste much time. She left. She wanted to talk to this woman whom she was holding to share her heart with. And she wanted to see what's happening to this woman the angel told her about. She was bursting with excitement. With news like hers, who would not be excited? You know, during that time, the, the, the Jews had been waiting for the Messiah for thousands of years. And here she was. Finally, the angel appeared to her and tells her that she will bear the Messiah. It's a news every proper Jewish girl would want to be for themselves. Mary was excited. Let me point out a few things. Firstly, remember, before the angel appeared to Mary and told her about it, Mary had no idea that Elizabeth was pregnant. Okay, Before the angel said so, Mary had no idea. There was no way for her to know unless somebody had traveled from there to her to inform her. But she evidently did not know before the angel informed her. And then, secondly, while Mary knew about Elizabeth's pregnancy because the angel told her, Elizabeth did not know about Mary's pregnancy. Okay? It was a new news and it had not yet reached Elizabeth. Third, Mary was newly pregnant, possibly only a few days or a few weeks old. 
So Mary traveled and arriving at her destination, she quickly greeted Elizabeth. And here, another miracle happens. Another miracle happens. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. As soon as Elizabeth hears Mary's greeting, the baby started dancing around. I'd like to imagine that was what happened. The baby, six months old, hearing the voice of Mary, starts dancing. Here's a quiz. Pop quiz. Who was this baby inside Elizabeth? Yes, John the Baptist. Cousin, well, maybe the second cousin or what of Jesus. John the Baptist was still in his mom's tummy. He was six months old as a fetus. It was, an, it was yet another three months before he will come out into the world. So the question is this. Who was John the Baptist? Do you know who John the Baptist was supposed to be? Of course, John the Baptist was the one God designated. John the Baptist was the one God designated as the one who would prepare the way for the Messiah. Okay? So that was John the Baptist's role from God. And here he was. Still six months, still a fetus, and yet, and yet, he was already testifying to his Lord. Can you imagine that? Talk about starting work early in life. He had not even been born, and he was already carrying out his God-given assignment. As has been pointed out earlier, Elizabeth didn't know about Mary's conception. But now, with John's joyous declaration and with the Holy Spirit's feeling, Elizabeth knows that Mary was pregnant with this very special child. What does this tell us about the value, well, of a fetus. Some groups insist that a fetus wasn't alive yet, but simply a clump of lifeless cells. Okay? Some groups insist that the fetus, as long as it has not yet been born, is a clump of lifeless cells. But here our Bible clearly shows us that is not true. This so-called clump of cells reacted to Mary's voice because this clump of cells was more than just a clump of cells. It was already life. And note that this Life inside Elizabeth was dancing for joy, was rejoicing over another life in the tummy of Mary. That 
other life in the tummy of Mary was probably just a few weeks old. Let me point out two important points. First, the life inside Mary, okay, the one inside Mary, the few day or few week old life inside Mary, that unborn John the Baptist was rejoicing about that life was the Messiah. This Messiah was God Himself. This says something about Mary, of course, how special Mary really was. At this time, while some groups called Mary the Mother of God, I'd like to point out we reject that. We reject that name. We simply say she's the God-bearer. She's the God-bearer. Giving her the title Mother of God, we believe, gives her a position that the Bible does not give her. Secondly, some groups believe in Mary's perpetual virginity that she lived all her life as a virgin and some say that she lived all her life sinless. But we believe these are not part of Bible teaching. And we ought to, put, to base our beliefs on what the Bible teaches, not simply on what we think. On the flip side, while it is wrong to give Mary the honor that the Bible does not give, it is also wrong not to rightly honor Mary, for the Bible does honor her as special. Another point, because fetuses are not simply lifeless clumps of cells, Abortion is more than just an ordinary medical surgery or procedure. It is murder. It is the taking of a life. This is also one reason why in vitro fertilization is controversial among Christians. Why? In vitro fertilization or simply IVF is taking a husband's sperm and putting it into the egg of the wife. But during IVF, usually this is done to multiple eggs. So multiple eggs are simultaneously fertilized. And then these fertilized eggs are put back are put into a woman's uterus for it to develop into a baby. But oftentimes, the multiple eggs, well, more eggs are being fertilized in the hope that there's a greater chance of success. But oftentimes also, not all those fertilized eggs can be put back in because it could be a lot. It could be seven, eight eggs. And here's where the problem comes in. How many fertilized eggs do you put into the mother's uterus or the wife's uterus? What do you do with those that you do not put in? And theoretically, these are already life. These are life. You cannot just destroy them. Actually, in the year 2000, 23 years ago, my wife and I went to Taiwan to do IVF. Beforehand, we both agreed that whatever number of fertilized eggs we get, we will insert everything. Bahala na si God. You know, let God take charge. Well, during the process, the doctor said three eggs were viable, were usable. 
And so three eggs were implanted into Christine's uterus. If they were successful, we would have instantly triplets. But God in his wisdom and in his goodness did not allow this to happen. It was not successful. Instead, many years down the line, God in his own wisdom gave us a precious, beautiful child in some other way. But again, the question is, what if there were more eggs? Like some couples there who had more eggs than they needed. What would they do? This can really be a moral dilemma. Anyway, moving on, though abortion is equivalent to the grave sin of murder, it is not unforgivable. We have a forgiving God. And if, if we have done something like that, we have been involved in abortion in the past, God can forgive. We only need to come to Him for forgiveness. Well, back to Elizabeth. Like Mary, we see Elizabeth to be a woman of faith. Her response to the situation portrays her as such. Firstly, Elizabeth had not yet talked to Mary, yet upon hearing Mary's voice, she identified Mary and her baby as unique. Elizabeth says, Blessed are you among women! And blessed is the fruit of your womb. Remember, again, Mary was only a few weeks old, well, a few weeks pregnant, rather, at the most. There was men, minimal, if any, bulge in Mary's tummy. But Elizabeth didn't need to see that bulge. The Holy Spirit revealed the truth to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth's own baby was the result of God's miraculous work. But she knew that that baby in Mary's tummy was even a greater miracle. And more blessed. Secondly, Elizabeth calls that baby inside Mary's womb her Lord. This was no ordinary baby. Though yet unborn, he calls him, she calls him her Lord. And that was a proclamation of inspired faith. He was her Lord, the Lord God himself, the Son of the Highest. He was the same one David called his Lord. He was the one for whom Elizabeth's own son will prepare the way. Thirdly, Elizabeth recognized that Mary's faith would also lead to blessing. So Elizabeth pronounced a blessing on Mary's faith. The Bible does honor Mary. So should we. What's our conclusion? Too young? Too old? Is there such a thing as too young or too old to serve God? Mary was young. Elizabeth was old. And yet, our passage today shows us that there is no such limitation for one to be used by God. Regardless of your age, you may be young, you may be old. God can use you. Both Elizabeth and Mary, in the face of seeming impossibility, they chose to say yes. They chose to say yes. They believed, they obeyed. Rather than make excuses why God cannot use them, they just said yes. 
Could it be that there are some among us who are saying, no, I've done this and that in the past. I've done this wrong, I've committed this sin, and therefore God cannot use me. God can forgive. He wants to forgive. And He can take a sinner, change the person, and use the person in His way. After all, isn't that what grace is all about? Taking an undeserving sinner and saving the sinner and using the sinner for his own purposes. That is grace. And God calls us to join him in his mission in this world. And he is pleased when we respond by faith, not in our own ability, but in his ability. Let's read this verse, Hebrews 11, 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please Him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. We can learn from Mary and Elizabeth's examples of faith to put our own faith into action. When we respond to God by faith, we will find God's reward waiting for us. In the face of seeming impossibility, Mary and Elizabeth did not focus on their own insufficiency, but they focused on the God of the impossible the God who takes the unqualified and makes them qualified. In the midst of impossibilities, Mary and Elizabeth find that. And let's read. For nothing will be impossible with God. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Let's take a moment to just think through the lives of Mary and Elizabeth and even John the Baptist. This six-month-old life in the tummy of Elizabeth. Proclaiming his master, his Lord, even before he was born. God is a God of impossibilities. Is God calling us to do something that we feel is impossible? With God, nothing will be impossible. We just need to believe and we need to obey. What's impossible in your life? Let us choose to obey. To be thankful that we have such an awesome God. Indeed, Father God, with you nothing will be impossible. Help us to believe, Lord. And may our belief show forth in action, in obedience. Thank you, Lord. Amen.